Welcome to the Commercial Disco. We're sitting here with, uh, or sitting virtually with Larry Marshall, the uh, Chief Executive of CSIRO. Welcome, Larry. Thanks, James. Pleasure to be here. Look, we've got a, uh, we're going to be covering a lot today because uh, obviously there is a lot going on in the world in science, but there's just a lot going on in the world generally, isn't there? Um, so uh, I'm going to start, though, just by kind of putting it to you that the coronavirus crisis has put a spotlight on science um, in a in a really positive in a positive way, and I think we've you know particularly in Australia, perhaps not in every country in the world, but in a, in Australia we've had a, a terrific response from the public, and I think it's been a, a sort of a demonstrated um, uh, trust in institutions, if you like. Like we've 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 kind of we've we've felt good about our institutions. Obviously, CSIRO is uh, one of our more important institutions across the landscape. So, what I wanted to to put to you, how do we, we had challenges in science and commercialization and eco, you know, the, the way the ecosystem works together. So how do we ensure that this kind of goodwill in that community can be, you know, extended into the future beyond, uh, you know, this current crisis reflection? Yeah, it's a great question, James, because if you could bottle the goodwill that we're seeing and we have seen over the past couple of months um, and, and keep it through through good times as well as as well as through the crisis, you'd 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 have a game changer for for innovation in this country. And I, I think that's your that's your key point. Um, you know, if, if I think back a hundred years, you know, Australia coming out of the First World War, and you know, a crisis like that, um, that was sort of the catalyst that created the CSIRO in the first place. And there's a lot of similarities. You know, the thinking back then was, hey, we need to really embrace science and technology and engineering and, and try and use it to kind of reinvent our situation to make the future better than the past. And that mindset of science seeing every challenge as an opportunity not just to be overcome, but actually to be turned around and, and turn into some kind of advantage. And I think it, that's the key insight. It's crisis and opportunity really are sort of opposite sides of the same coin of disruption. So I guess uh, the extension to that, and this, this is where is one of those questions that you, you probably won't love to, to jump at, but I mean, we, we, are, we are literally in, in the middle of, a, of the preparation of a federal budget. Now, you, you don't have uh, control over that federal budget, although I'm sure you have your own opinions about what might go into it. But I mean, we, at, at this stage, given what you've seen in the, the reaction, you know, the, how we've used, how this, this crisis has, has been the payoff for our investments in science in the past, are you expecting budget largesse? Are you expecting budget cuts? Like we, we've got, the, the government's got a lot of competing priorities. So how, how do you think this is going to pan out? Yeah, look, I mean, we're we're facing into um, a, a, a massive budget deficit because of all of the need for um, government to support the public, uh, industry and, and people, keep uh, keeping us safe. And that's a huge cost. And obviously, it's, it's got to be paid back. So, you know, I think it'll be a tough budget, but it's a tough situation that we're coming out of. Um I think the key for us is to focus on um, how do we get back to a place, not just how do, not just how do we get back to where we were. I don't think we want to do that. I think that would be a shame, actually. I think we want to figure out how do we use this whole crisis and everything that we've learned, um, like the massive acceleration of uh, digital, you know, digital transformation has really enabled us to work from home through this. I think there's a lot of those nuggets that we want to keep and in a sense, use that crisis and that disruption to redefine our future um, in a better way. So maybe we will travel less. Maybe we will do more um, Zoom meetings or other um, video type meetings. Maybe we'll learn to do a lot more digitally because we've had to. So there's some there's some benefits that come out of that where I think the rather than going back to normal, we'll, we'll go back to a new normal that's actually better than the better than the old one. So when we look at facilities like your uh, the Geelong um, uh, the biomedical research, so you got a level four lab down there. Is that I've got that right? Yeah, down. yeah. It's one of 
it's one of five or six in the world. It's quite unique. Yeah. All right, and and that facility has just received some additional funding um, that I think was not necessarily in the pipeline. Yeah, it's just been. Um, so I, sh I should back up a step, James. We the, the facility's been around a long time, thirty or more years. Um, but when we started our current strategy back in 2016, um, we saw the opportunity and the need, frankly. It, it, had, it had been created to deal with animals and animal health, you know, protecting Australia from foot and mouth, that sort of thing. And we realised that actually diseases aren't discriminating anymore between animals and humans, so we needed to reposition it much more firmly into, into human health or actually what we call one health, basically stop differentiating between whether it's an animal disease or a human disease because too many are crossing over and, and really look holistically at solving the kind of one health problem. So that was the shift that we did in 2016. We actually created a health business unit as well, specifically to deal with sort of the challenges of, of digital disruption and the opportunities in health using digital, but also the challenges of physical disruption like pandemics. And so we were in a much better position to jump on this crisis because we did those changes back in 2016. And that, I mean, I'm, I'm presuming that, that the, the specific challenges now that we have uh, you know, suit that facility very well and suit the other investments you've made in, into digital. So how do you kind of double down on that? Um, and even if we take a step back and look at that uh, Innovation and Science Australia, one of, their, one of their recommendations of a couple of years ago was to, to have the health as a, as a national challenge. Um, so how, how do we double down on that? Yeah, so... so um the the ACDP got to be careful not to say ACDC because that's taken. Um, that that facility is kind of the part of the front line of Australia's sort of biosecurity defence. But but one of the other big changes we made, and, and this goes to your point about about innovation, um, was in our manufacturing group, because it's it's one thing to you know protect against a pandemic or biosecurity threats. Um, it's one thing to measure and test the vaccine. But at the end of the day, um, someone's actually got to manufacture it. And we realised there was kind of a gap in Australia's system in terms of ability to go from invention, you know, on the lab bench to innovation in terms of a vaccine. So we built this manufacturing capability in our manufacturing business um, to much more rapidly be able to go from an idea, like a vaccine candidate, to scale it up, scale up the proteins and the other um, bio um, biophysical um, properties to a point where you could actually support phase one or phase two clinical trials and, and actually have a hope of getting something into manufacturing. And I just also say, um, you know, there's, if you think about the two sides, you know, TRL zero, the, the invention, you know, the idea, and TRL nine or 10, where a manufacturer's in, in production, you know, most of the R&D system plays down here in TRL zero to three, and that's where they should play. Um, Syro kind of plays a little bit in that space, but more in the middle of how do we get these amazing inventions? How do we get them over the valley of death into, into some kind of manufacturable capability? And finally, I'd say it's the manufacturers that actually do the heavy lifting there. Um, without them, you know, nothing any of us did would actually be able to deliver impact because someone's actually got to take it, build it, get it to market and be responsible for it. And, you know, that's the reason this teamwork is so important right now, James, because you're seeing manufacturers like CSL step up, lean into the crisis and try and work with the R&D system to make sure that we actually will have an Australian um, supply of the vaccine. Yeah, I mean, it, it's quite extraordinary. I, I wasn't really going to go here, but I'll, I'll just put it to you. Um, the, the National COVID Response, the NCCC Commission, um, the Manufacturing Task Force doesn't spend a lot of time talking about uh, the kind of advanced manufacturing that you've just described. It spends a lot of time talking about gas um, and uh, energy prices for our manufacturers, which uh, is kind of neither here nor there for the, a manufacturer of vaccines. Um, I wonder, I, I wonder as, as a broad commentary, uh, you know, when we talk about manufacturers, it would also seem to me 
they didn't talk about IoT. They didn't talk about 5G. There was very, I don't think there was any mention of artificial intelligence or machine learning, all things that I would have thought um, are kind of uh, imperative to a, a, a modern advanced manufacturer, you know, across a broad range of sectors, maybe outside of the, you know, the, the oily rag end of things. But even in car manufacturing, most of the IP is in, is in your uh, information technologies. Yeah, it, it's so true. So much of the value of a car today is in the semiconductor chips, the, the processors, and also the software um, that runs on them. Um, you know, I, I grew up, my, my dad drove a Holden. Um, I love Holdens. <laughs> but but we got to move on, you know. Um, we, we It would be a shame if we went back to manufacturing kind of old old school or old world products. Um you know, the other change that we made in, in Cyrus manufacturing was we recognised that there's this ability to leapfrog to, you know, truly agile manufacturing using digital, using AI, using predictive analytics, using um, 3D printing, um, and, uh, and, and even biological and quantum biological processes to actually grow um, uh, structures that can be part of manufacturing, almost like self-assembling capabilities that you've probably read about in science fiction books. So that that vaccine pipeline capability, the reason we didn't do it in our health business, we actually deliberately chose to do it separately in our manufacturing business, was we thought there was a bigger story there about the idea of manufacturing becoming truly agile, meaning, you know, you used to build a factory to make cars. Um, now you build a factory to make almost anything. Um, and you have the equipment, the technology um, to rapidly shift from making one type of product to another because you've leapfrogged that using using technology. And I think that's the opportunity here. If, if we can come back smarter, you know, there'll be a push to make commodity products, you know, just because they're a sovereign source. But, gee, it would be better if we had the ability to make almost anything we needed in a pinch but focus on the really high value, high margin products that are uniquely Australian um, to give us a differentiation. And I, I think that's where truly agile manufacturing supported by technology can really make a difference here. Yeah, I, I mean, the way you describe it, it's very exciting. I find it very exciting. We've got, um, you know, in areas that the, uh, in the areas that the CSIRA has been involved in, uh, the, the kind of antivirus um, the vaccine manufacturer or you look at space there's so much uh, you know nano satellites being manufactured and we have some capability there we're about to build a launch capability in in rockets i think gilmore space is is sort of on target to do a commercial launch in the next couple of years um quantum computing i know kathy foley just did some work but we've got some some game there in manufacturing none of which is kind of described in our uh covid commission report on uh, on manufacturing it just seems like there's a, a bit of a gap there. Maybe we need to lean in there, James, you and I. Well, that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do right now. <laughs> um, okay, let's, uh, we'll, we'll move on from that. I, I guess uh, just I did have a, a question in relation to the budget cycle um, around people, people and skills. Firstly, I, I guess... Uh, Time will tell whether you will be fully budgeted to maintain current staffing levels. Have you got any indications on on whether there's any any reason to think that the CSIRO might need to downsize? Look, I, I um, I'm optimistic, but James, you know me, I'm I'm always an optimist. You, you couldn't be an entrepreneur or an innovator if you if you weren't. So so I'm optimistic. Um, you know, but part of the reason for that. CIRO has grown its external revenue significantly over the last five or so years. So we have well over 500 million of external revenue in the organization now. And um, whilst there will be some disruption to that, um, I've been surprised how many companies have leaned into us to say, you know, we need this or we need that. We need you to be thinking about the future. We want to come out of this better. So we've had a lot of engagement which surprised me, frankly, during the crisis, given how hard it is to engage. We've had a lot of engagement from companies that are really starting to think in a better way, a more positive way about the future. So I'm actually hopeful that that will, that will help um, fuel us through this. And, and not just us, but if the, if the broader system is thinking about how to, how to use this crisis to, to come out better, 
then I think it will naturally mean more support for R&D, more support for science, provided science delivers. And that's, of course, the other side of the coin, right? If we don't deliver, then, you know, we don't deserve to be supported. We've got to earn that right, you know, every day. All right, another one on people. Uh, and, and this is really goes to collaboration and mainly international collaboration. But, you know, obviously you've got a fairly porous community of people who are coming in from uh, other institutions around the world and, and, and your guys are going out. Uh, so what, what sort of impact will, will that have if there's a longer term shutdown on, on, on that very close, uh, you know, physically proximate um, collaborations? You know, it, it will impact our global collaboration, to be to be sure. Um, fortunately, again, in, during the current strategy, Strategy 2020, we, we created some um, international outposts like the Silicon Valley um, office, um, like the Singapore um, uh, presence and, and the China presence. So we have people on the ground now in those countries that can engage in, in those ecosystems, so it keeps us connected. But Sara drew um, draws a lot of its strength, of course, by from global collaboration, which you know you can do you can do a certain amount of that digitally, but in the end, you're right, you do need to be able to physically get together, particularly for the for the for the sort of physical science stuff, um, and and that's going to be hard because I, I don't think we'll see international travel coming back, you know, this year, um, based on just the way the rest of the world is um, struggling to deal with this crisis. So that'll be a challenge. Just as a as a general statement, without wanting you to predict the future, but uh, given the global trade tensions have kind of spilled over into the coronavirus response tensions and 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 all of the, all that goes with it, and and we already had something of a, a technological, you know, the beginnings of a of a cold war going on. Um, in relation to those collaborations, is there a danger that you know we fracture into blocks that the relationships that you have? With China, and I know that they're very uh, long-standing and, and deep uh, with the C- CSIRO and the, Australian, and the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Like, is there a danger that those fracture, and what would that mean if they did? Yeah, yeah. So, so James, it's it's funny. Um, you know, the, the Chinese Academy of Sciences is near the top in the world now in terms of its um, academic excellence, which is remarkable because thirty years ago they were weren't on the radar, and they've really They've, they've gone very hard to, to strive for a very high academic standard. And we try to collaborate with people in the world who are share our aspiration of using science, you know, to make the future better. In, in China, we really focus around, you know, climate, the environment, um, remediation of soil and water, um, and then work on uh, truly global problems like climate change or, or this pandemic. So... Um, China, within 24 hours of, of me reaching out to my counterpart to get information on the virus, they gave us full genetics, genotype, phenotype, basically everything that we asked for to help us understand what we we're dealing with and how to fight it. So that's an example of why that really deep, long history of collaboration is so critical. And that got us right to the front line of, of fighting the, the disease. Um, the thing that's funny to me is if I look back 30 years, you know, China came from here to sort of top of the pyramid in terms of science. Um, I asked my counterpart, why do you work with us? Because they're huge. There's 130 or more thousand people in that organisation now. And he laughed and said, yes, but 30 years ago, you know, you were the huge one and we were small and, you know, we don't forget that that friendship, that relationship kind of working together. And I think you know, you, you can do a lot of things, but you can't you can't change history. You can't you know create time. So four decades or more working together and and solving a lot of challenges like this one, I think there's a deeper connection there. And 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 I think more broadly around the world, those connections we have the connection with the US in the same way. Um, I think science does tend to transcend um, the politics and the, the the geopolitics because if you're working on a global problem. By definition, you can't solve it if you don't work with global with global players. So I think we just have to figure out how to navigate this because we know the outcome will be, will be better if we do. Yeah, it's uh, uh, it certainly won't be straightforward. I wouldn't have thought, but um, you know, just given the the political realities, but uh, you know, to the extent that it does, yes, uh, I guess science does transcend um, you know the day to day politics. 
Um, but uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. It seems, seems like it seems like a challenge, but we'll see see how you go. Um, Larry, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about engagement with the startup sector, and and also the well, not necessarily talking about spinning out um, CSIRO companies, but uh, but certainly getting a, a getting this entre entrepreneurialism infused into some of the CSIRO workforce. I'm talking about the ON program, uh, which I think the funding was coming to a close um, this financial year, so uh, soon. I mean, I, I guess the money has, the final program's been run. So ha what are the options around maintaining the outcomes of that program? How will you refund it if, if indeed you are going to refund it? Or how will you, you know, design something else to replace it? Yeah, and, and James, you know, as we've talked about before, on ONS had stellar outcomes. I mean, if you compare it to the US I-Corps program, which was kind of the original um, science accelerator in the world, um, it, it outperforms that in financial terms almost three to one in terms of, you know, how successful the companies are when they graduate through it. But actually, the one that the stat that always amazed me, it, it, it has 50% um, greater uh, diversity, 50% greater penetration into the sector than I-Corps has with less than half the funding per, per company, per capita. So it's, there's something very special about that program that's made it successful. And I think what it was is, um, you know, the diversity is designed in kind of in our DNA because core to our strategy, we know that you can't have innovation without diversity. So there's no metrics, no targets. It's just designed in the way we thought about the program. And, and in a sense, it's because we didn't design it to create startups. We didn't design it to create financial outcomes. We got those um, and, and got really good ones. We designed it to kind of change the way scientists thought, to do a culture change. And because almost every university across the country and many government agencies as well participated in it, I think that cultural journey has happened. I think over the last four years, we've really got scientists to think differently about the power of science and how to actually how to actually get something from it, how to get a, a, an outcome. Um, so it, it, its work may actually be done, uh, and that's the question. I think the crisis, you're quite right, raises the question, do we have to rethink it? You know, is there another, is there another, um, is there another life to on, another incarnation of on that might be necessary to help us get out of the crisis? And, and we're working through that at the moment. But the original idea was fund it for four years, um, see if we make a culture change, and then reassess and maybe do something, maybe do something different. Um, if I can just say too, there's a theme to all of these, um, I think, innovation questions where how do you think differently about the future and use that, that vision, that where the market could be, that market vision to drive your science, to actually create that reality, to create that vision. I mean, that's what the Australian National Outlook was all about. You know, let's think of a better future and then figure out how science can help us get there. I think that's the culture change we need rather than, you know, we're going to do this great science and be world-leading, you know, inventors or whatever. Maybe start from the other end and say, we're going to solve these really big problems, these big national challenges. How can science help us? So more of a market-driven innovation, which is the way startups do it, right, rather than a Rather than a science push, more of a more of a market pull. Does that make sense? It makes sense to me. I I uh, I would consider that kind of quite non-controversial, but I'm sure that there's people whose hair would catch on fire as they hear you say that. And I, <laughs> and I think, and, and I think you've probably been, uh, you know, that's been a mantra of yours for for five years. I think since you've come back. Um, so just to close off on on the on program, I mean, w without labouring the point, you, are you saying that that's mission accomplished as far as cultural change goes? At, at, at that kind of uh, thinking about how you you might you know thinking of impact rather than simply the the science itself. You know, it, it's um, time will tell. I mean, one I guess one indicator though that that something changed is when we built on. It was very unique. You know, there, there, there were there was really not much in the in the academic sector in terms of you know that type of program. And I'm talking not just about accelerators, but accelerator, um, you know, market connection. You know, sorrow, three thousand customers to the table. 
um, the national lab capability to kind of turn these ideas into prototypes. It's quite a unique offering. But if I look, well, sorry, if I look into last year before this crisis, I think there were like 37 accelerators across the country kind of leaning into doing what we were calling deep tech or, or science. And so clearly, you know, that, that's a change. I think your big question, the big question we're wrestling with now is will those 37 continue post-crisis or will the crisis mean they, they go away? And, and that's what we're, I think that's what we're trying to figure out next. You know, what's the, what's the next card to play if there is, an, if there is another card? Yeah. Okay. Look, I, I'm conscious of time. So uh, just a couple more quick ones. They're actually really big questions. And so like, I don't want to say they're, they're quick questions, but uh, look, when we're, as we're rethinking the, the sort of the ecosystem, how the different parts of the ecosystem um, play together, is, is it time to kind of, should we be rethinking everything? Um, I'm, I'm wondering whether it's time that uh, there is a, a level of consolidation around just the numbers of CRCs and growth centres and institutes and, you know, the CSIRO itself. And, you know, there is a, from the outside, and I'm an outsider, it, it seems a very fragmented uh, approach to, to building what are generally kind of integrated sectors these days. What do you think about the idea of consolidation? So um, I think you've got to ask that question in, after a crisis um, because it's a, it's a natural consequence of trying to manage your way out, trying to, trying to manage your finances, manage your, manage your focus because digging your way out of a crisis only happens if you're really focused on, on, on very in a singular way on, on that outcome. So I think it's the right question to ask. If you look at the UK, um, they have followed that model um, they've done a major consolidation to get a bit more alignment and a bit more focus um, in the system, and and I know that various people are looking at the UK um, at the UK model. Um, the other one that's really interesting is Canada, and and I, I tend to look to Canada more than I look to the US or the UK or or anywhere because it's in my mind it's the closest to us in terms of similar culture, similar population size similar resources-based economy. And, and Canada has somehow got nearly 40% of their companies, especially the SMEs, doing new-to-world innovation. And in Australia, it's less than 2%. So yeah. that's something to aspire to if we can figure out how the Canadians did it. And role clarity, um, really being explicit about who does what and why, their system does look more aligned than many innovation systems in the world. And I know we're talking to, I um, talk to my counterpart quite frequently who runs the National Science Foundation in Canada. Um, we talk about things like, what are we going to do about bushfires, common problem that we share together? Should we figure out a, 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 a national challenge that we both work on, um, like we do on climate change? So an, a challenge is a great way to align us to the same outcome. Um, so this, I guess... To finish, there's two ways to do consolidation. One is the way that the UK did it, where you bring everything together. The other way is to say, you know what, we're going to work on these three things. And you said it before. Um, I think it was an Innovation Oz recommendation or a, an ISA recommendation. We're going to work on these challenges, you know, bushfires, droughts, pandemics. We're going to identify them as national challenges. And, you know, there'll be sort of lighthouses to bring us together to have us focus on the outcomes of solving those challenges. And that way you don't have to rearrange everything. You can just kind of it's the it's the carrot approach rather than the rather than the stick approach. I think that'd be worth looking at too. Yeah, interesting what you're saying about Canada. I think uh, we had the quantum physicist Michael Bierce talking to us last week and was also talking about Canada and its success with uh, with deep tech startups, particularly around uh, Waterloo, I think, in Ontario. Um, Okay, fi look, finally, I, there, there are a whole bunch of other questions, Larry Marshall, I would like to be asking you today, but uh, can't do it. I guess as, to finish off, and this is probably an annoying question, I, I don't know, but, uh, you know, you came from a, a very different background, and we've talked about this before, um, for, for a CSIRO chief, um, having spent the, the time that you did in Silicon Valley and being in very commercial startups and, and ending up in, in venture capital before you, you took this role. So I guess as you look at the landscape now and you look at the landscape when you came in, I'm wondering what's, what you're seeing that's different and 
what you would do differently. I mean, I have no doubt that there's been a lot of challenges along the way and, and some great successes, but what, what would you do differently from the get-go if you had your time again? <laughs> um, yeah, honestly, <laughs> not, not much. <laughs> but, but that's me. I, I'm, I'm not much of one for regrets. So, no, I, I probably wouldn't change anything, actually. And, and I think even, even the painful bits um, that we went through, you, you kind of got to do that because if, if, you, don't have, um, if you don't have some pain um, you, you don't get, or, or a crisis, you, you don't get the catalyst to really, to really change. So, you know, it, it is painful to go through. Um, I might go harder in some areas than, than we did, but the thing is, um, you know, leadership is, is often about disappointing people at a rate that they can accept, and sometimes you, you, you exceed that rate and then you, you've got to back off um, because you've got to take people on the journey with you. Um, but no, I, I, the, probably not much that I'd change. I think going forward, um, you know, how do we build on the value of all that change? Because Sorrow, I think, is in a much better place now to really act on these crises. So, you know, when's the last time a prime minister reached out to Syro first call? Hey, go go, give me a science and technology plan to recover from bushfires. Actually, you know what? Let's make it broader. Let's look at the whole um, uh, resilience area, the whole disruption area around floods and fires and other other impacts like that. That's where the organisation was when it was created 100 years ago. Um, that's where we should be. And, and it's really gratifying that, that our, our Prime Minister and others, our government, looks at us to, to step in and really um, help the nation, you know, navigate their way through these crises. I want to see us doing more of that because um, that's what we're all about. All right, Larry Marshall, we might leave it. Thank you very much. I must say your description of leadership as being about disappointing people at a rate they can accept makes, makes uh, leadership sound so appealing. <laughs> I, um, I really appreciate you being on the Commercial Disco and uh, we'll catch up again soon. James, really, you do so much for us, for this country and innovation. Just I'm really glad you're there and, and thank you. I oh, appreciate it. Okay, good on you.